Hey friends, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study. Today we're jumping back into the book of Revelation. We're looking at chapter 9 today, specifically the 5th and the 6th trumpet judgments. Before we get into it, a few announcements. We're really excited to announce the official release date of our new film, Ballads of the Exodus. It's going to be released on the FAI app and only on the FAI app. It'll be available uh, in the morning in Jerusalem time on the 9th of July. We're going to be releasing some uh, videos and articles and some prep and lead up for uh, what to expect and how to prepare for the release of this film. This film is unlike any of our other films uh, on uh, many levels, but one of the levels is the way in which we produce the film to be viewed and experienced in a community collective setting. So we're going to be inviting you and uh, anyone else in the nations of the earth who would like to host a roadshow watch party of this film. The film is three and a half hours long. It has a traditional overture and intermission that breaks the film up into the two parts. We produced the film to, uh, with the intention of it being a, a nod to old cinema classics uh, from days gone by where we had these uh, amazing spectacles, you know, Lawrence of Arabia, Gone with the Wind, Khartoum, uh, Patton, these, you know, long films that were very, uh, uh, for, I know the word has been so overused, but they were epic films in terms of the scope and the scale and the time frame. And so that's what we were aiming for with Ballads of the Exodus. And the way that the film is meant to be viewed is surely not on your iPhone uh, in your bed alone at night before you go to sleep. This film is meant to be experienced as a corporate, collective, community uh, event. And the whole goal of the film is to go deep in the book of Exodus, to go deep into the message of the book of Exodus through exploring the message of the book through the life and the mind and the heart and the experience of this incredible figure, this leader that we all know his name around the world, Moses. It's it, the, the thing about Exodus is, you know, everyone around the world to some degree is familiar with the Exodus story for the most part, because he's such a towering figure, both in Jewish history, obviously, Christian history, and even Islamic history. So we're really hoping and believing that this film is going to uh, run like wildfire outside of our uh, traditional circles of some of our other films. You know, we've done uh, many documentaries about the Middle East uh, over the years, and this one is a, a very different style of film altogether. So we're going to be releasing uh, some more details and information about that in the days ahead. But suffice it to say this for the announcement for, for, for now, for you, if you're watching this, consider hosting a watch party uh, a, a, in your community on either July 9th, which is a Friday, or July 10th, which is on a Saturday. Um, and again, because it's a three and a half hour film, because there's an intermission, um, it's not the kind of thing that, you know, you have your friends over for an hour and a half, eat dinner and watch the film. It's, it's kind of a matinee all day event. So it's, uh, we just hosted the first premiere and screening of it in Tel Aviv here in Israel last weekend. And we're premiering it in the United States and Dallas, Texas here uh, in a few weeks. And then in the lead up to, to the 9th. So if you're interested in that, keep an eye out on the FAI app for more details about that and how you can get a hold of the film to screen it. That's one. Two, if you're appreciating these teachings, if you're appreciating the free films, all of the content that's available on the app. I want to ask you if you'd consider becoming a monthly supporter of FAI at $5 a month. We're seeing a massive shift within FAI at the moment once the Lord gave us this idea of $5 a month from those who appreciate the content, one, and two, who care about laying foundations where there are none in the 1040 window in the Middle East among unreached and unengaged People. So if the powerful thing is $5 is not that much money and almost anyone can do it, but with the collective combination of $5 giving 
from the base of people around the world who believe in the Maranatha message, who believe in the Romans 15 mandate, and who appreciate all of the free content that is uh, at your fingertips on the FAI app, um, the $5 thing is a massive game changer. We're so grateful for all of those who have already become $5 monthly supporters. I want to ask if you would consider doing the same. It would be uh, a, a tremendous blessing for our guys uh, and gals, mostly gals, by the way, who are leading and pioneering all over the Middle East uh, today as we speak. That's where these funds are going to. And we're very excited to see where this is going to go in the days ahead. Okay, Revelation chapter 9. This is arguably one of the more bizarre chapters in the whole book of Revelation. Um, the other chapters, you know, the whole book kind of gets a rap for being, you know, bizarre and strange and weird, but it's pretty straightforward. And it's pretty biblical, uh, not pretty biblical, it is biblical. It's pretty uh, straightforward in the sense that it's drawing from biblical texts, concepts, ideas that are already long established. You know, these aren't new ideas. It's not new concepts. It's, for example, the, the trumpet judgments that came before this, it, they, they reflect the same logic and pattern as the plagues of Egypt in the book of Exodus. So there is, it's not new. This is not, it's not like, wow, the Lord has never released plagues on the earth before. No, he has. There's already a precedent for it. Now, chapter 9 is one of the first places in the book of Revelation where the precedent, uh, where there's, the, there's a breaking. There's a breaking in of a new reality, a new precedent. We haven't seen this anywhere in Scripture up to this point in this capacity. We've seen pieces of it. We've seen glimpses of it. But Revelation 9 is one of the more strange, bizarre and the reason why it's strange and bizarre is because it's brand new. It's like, wow, I've never read that anywhere. Is there a cross-reference for that somewhere? It's like, nope, this is the only place that you read this. Uh, it's a very, very strange chapter, but the message of the chapter is crystal clear. And as we'll see, my goal in this is, you know, Joel and I were talking about it. And if you didn't watch Joel's session last week, I really urge you to watch it. It was very, very... Uh, um, I just so appreciate the way Joel laid it out and explained um, the tensions within the book of Revelation concerning interpretation and, and concerning the issue of pastoral preparation. Like, how do we prepare our lives and the people around us, and how do we do that with this fog of uncertainty around some of the events in the book of Revelation? And on the heels of what Joel was saying about that, I want to hone in on uh, this point before we begin. There are elements in Revelation chapter 9 which are unclear on a number of levels what exactly does that mean because it's so, it's just so dang bizarre. But the message, the landing point, the main emphasis of these two events, the fifth and the sixth trumpet, and the main emphasis of this chapter is absolutely crystal clear. There's no, there's no ambiguity about the message and where it lands. Now, having said that, there are no chapter breaks in the way that the book was designed because it wasn't written as a book. It was given as a vision, as an experience of the whole thing. So the whole book, there are no chapter divisions. The chapters were put in later, much, much, much later. But when the book was given, it was given as a letter written out with no chapter division. So it's a little bit not correct to say the message of the chapter because this chapter is not... It's not as, we shouldn't read the book like just chapters. We should read them uh, as an interconnected whole. In Revelation chapter 9, even though it is a chapter, it, it fits within the broader context and structure of the book. So as we go through it, um, I want to start by saying, reiterating the point that I already made because I really want you to catch this and hear this and then test this as we move through this. The message of these two events are crystal clear. The landing point, the application, the framing of it, the essence, the heart of it is very clear. The heart of this message is the consequences of human rebellion globally against the leadership of God amidst his global judgments. That's the message of the fifth and the sixth trumpet. That is the message. It's the consequences and impact of human rebellion, sin, depravity, wickedness. This is the height of human sin in the book of Revelation is the fifth and the sixth trumpet. 
This is where the, the it's as if the, you know, when, when Pharaoh hardened his heart over again in the book of Exodus, and then there's the final hardening before the final plagues, and then the, the, the closing up of this hour of judgment. That's what this is. Now, the fifth and the sixth trumpet are between the first four trumpets and the seventh trumpet, which is an obvious point because it's called the fifth and the sixth and they're numbered. Now, it's important to recognize the flow of the judgment events. In the seals, we had a series of events, right? In those events, it's mostly dynamics. It's global dynamics taking place. We have wars, we have famine, we have economic collapse. We have a number of dynamics, mass martyrdom. We have all these things taking place. And then in the first four trumpets, we see that the environment Nature, the earth is being affected, water, vegetation, light, sky, air. It's being affected. It's being impacted by the first four judgment events. But people have yet to be the recipients of the judgment of God in that they're bearing the, the pain of those judgments in and on their bodies. That's why the fifth and the sixth trumpet is so significant and unique is because this is the turning point in the story. This is the turning point in the the unfolding of the judgments, which is another reason why I don't subscribe to the idea that the book of Revelation is just this recapitulating cyclical thing or that it's overlapping because the logic of these events is that they're increasing in intensity they're increasing in consequence as humanity continues to harden their hearts. Meaning at the very beginning of this thing, when it's wars, when it's economic collapse, when it's, when it's vegetation being touched, when it's water being touched, human beings are giving an oppor given an opportunity to turn. The biblical terminology for this is repent. It means turn. You soften your heart, tear your heart, rend your heart, not your garments. Like turn to the Lord, turn away from what is the cause of these judgments being released on the earth. And the Lord in his kindness and in his mercy is progressively intensifying just as he did in the days of Exodus. You know, the first judgment event was not the death of the firstborn. It was the last. The first judgment event is milder. It doesn't inflict death. Now, some of the judgment events inflicted pain and irritation on the human body. We have like gnats and sores and boils. We have water turning to blood, which means you're washing your, your children and all of a sudden in the bathtub, they, the, your child's covered in blood. You go to you know, do the dishes and you're cleaning your dishes and all of a sudden your dishes are dripping with blood. You go to drink water and the water that you drink is filled with blood. The Nile is blood. The rivers are blood. The lakes are blood. The reservoir is blood. The estuaries are blood. But it's not touching your body yet. And then we have a turn because Pharaoh hardened his heart and the escalations of the judgments begin to unfold. That's what's taking place in the fifth and the sixth trumpet. Leading up to the colossal towering event in the book of Revelation called the seventh trumpet. Now we're going to focus a number of sessions on the seventh trumpet. The seventh or the last or the final or the great trumpet is the one of the most significant events in the book of Revelation and in natural history. The seventh trumpet is staggering in its implication and consequences. That's the next judgment event. And it follows on the heels of the corporate, collective, global hardening of human hearts in the face of God's judgments. So the first four judgments, we see the, 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 the inflicting of judgment upon the environment. The fifth and the sixth, we see the judgments now being directed and pointed directly at people. Not the people of God, not the saints. Now, there's this interesting argument within the, the pre-tribulation camp. They say the church is nowhere to be seen in the book of Revelation, which we've touched on this so many times. I'm not going to go into it again. But and yet another example of why that argument breaks down. In Revelation chapter 8 and chapter 9, there is judgments released by the use of demons, demons to torment people. 
But this de- this torment, it says, but don't touch those who are marked. These are the saints. This is the church. Now, the pre-tribulation camp will conveniently say, or even some of the variations of the pre-wrath camp will say, well, this the church is not there. This is tribulation saints. There is no verse that says that. This is the church on the earth amidst these judgments before the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet, the final trumpet, the great trumpet. The, the seventh trumpet, by the way, is spoken about all over the Bible. It's spoken of by Isaiah, it's spoken of in Ezekiel, it's spoken of by Jesus, by Paul, by John. It's spoken, it, it, the, the, the power of this, the intertextual uh, message of the final trumpet is amazing. I'm so excited to get into it in future sessions. But for now, suffice it to say this, that the lead up to the final trumpet being sounded is the saints being protected from being impacted by this one. And we, like Moses and Aaron, are releasing these judgments on the earth through intercession, through prayer, and through the prophetic ministry, and through our lives. Don't, you know, when we hear prophetic ministry, some of you may imagine, like, the guy at the, you know, the non-denominational church revival meeting up the road, holding big meetings in the midst of the tribulation and calling down judgments. I don't think... I mean, that may be a part of it. I don't know, but I don't think that that's really what we're looking at here. What we're looking at is a season of global tribulation, turmoil, war, famine, economic collapse, persecution, sin, immorality, depravity, rebellion, raging. And in the midst of that, the people of God, like Moses and Aaron, are quietly and humbly releasing the judgments of God on the Antichrist's empire, and the rebellious of the nations who refuse to submit to the leadership of God in the midst of his judgments as he releases judgments on those who are targeting the Jewish people and the people of the covenant, believers in Jesus. This is what we we saw, what we talked about in, 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 in past sessions is that Israel becomes the target of the wrath of the evil one and of the Antichrist's empire at the end. And the church, by association, steps into that same role. We bear that same stigma side by side with him, which means we are releasing judgments on the empire, the coalition, the military coalition that is targeting the Jewish people for annihilation. That's the context of the releasing of these trumpet events. Now, if you say, oh, the church is not here for it, or these are just tribulation saints, it skews the whole logic of the book of Revelation. And it also tampers with the patterns that we see throughout Scripture, specifically the book of Exodus, where the people of the covenant are not the victims of the judgments. They are the instruments of releasing these judgments on the earth. So... The fifth and the sixth trumpet. Let's jump into it. This, there's 21 verses in this chapter. For time's sake, I don't know how, how much we'll read every verse and go through it. Um, but we're going we're gonna to do our best. So let's start back in chapter 8. Okay, Now chapter 8, remember the prayers of the saints are hurled at the earth and the trumpets begin because of the prayers of the saints. Again, the church in a pivotal consequential role, releasing the first four trumpet events. Look at verse 13. This is after the fourth angel. Then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe. Three woes. To those who dwell on the earth, at the blast of the other trumpets, the three angels are about to blow. So now we know that the last three judgment events in this series of trumpets are called woes. There are three woes that are to come. The fifth, sixth, and seventh woe or uh, sorry, trumpets, which are the first, second, and third woes. The fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. And he was given the key to a shaft of the bottomless pit. Now, the word fallen here is actually kind of, I don't think it's a good translation. The word actually means to just come down or to descend. Fallen is not, like the ESV here says fallen. It kind of has a, like a demonic like a, like a fallen angel kind of a deal. That's, I don't think that's the point of this. It's descended. This is the same thing we see in the millennium in chapter 20 or in other places. We see an angel who has authority to do something. He descends to do that thing. 
he's not like falling in rebellion or he's falling in judgment or falling in you know iniquity he's coming down to do a task that's the that's what's happening here he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit there's numbers of passages both in uh, peter's epistles and the book of jude um, in the book of matthew there's a number of passages that refer to demons angels rebellious sinful angels being locked in bottomless pit being locked in chains jude in peter says it's a strange concept but it's it's established very clearly in the new testament there are demons right now who are incarcerated and who are not allowed to roam there are demons who are not incarcerated who are allowed to roam the powers and rulers and principalities of the air you know, Paul wrote extensively about this. You know, Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is one of the most demonic books. I don't mean, meaning it's a demonic book, meaning it's a book that has more information about demons than almost any book in the Bible. We see the book of Job. Satan is able to, he has a degree of autonomy. He can move, he's roaming. Okay? We know that there's demons moving and operating in the world. The God of this age blinds the minds of unbelievers, Paul says. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities and rulers in heavenly places, right? Well, that's non-incarcerated demons. There are incarcerated demons who are locked and bound and held for an appointed time for a specific purpose, namely this. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions on the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So only people. Don't touch the vegetation. Don't touch the earth. This is a stark contrast to the first four trumpets. The first four trumpets were touch the earth, touch the trees, touch the vegetation, touch the water, touch the earth. Now it's saying don't touch the earth. Only people, or in a negative sense, don't touch the earth and don't touch the people who are marked or sealed. This is the people of the covenant, the people of God. The people who are marked don't touch them. Now, this framework was presented for the first time, really. It happens multiple times in, in different ways, but the most clear way is in the book of Ezekiel. In the book of Ezekiel, we see the same thing. Judgment being released in the city of Jerusalem, except for on those who are marked. The Lord has a way of marking those who are his and says, don't touch that one. Don't touch that one. Don't touch that one. Everything else is fair game. Go. And then it gets, it gets really heavy. Verse 5. They were allowed to torment them. This is people who are not sealed. For five months. So we have a timing indication here. Five months. But not to kill them. Not to kill them. This is very different than the sixth trumpet. I'll just give you a, a spoiler here. The fifth trumpet is harm them, don't kill them. The sixth trumpet is kill them, don't harm them. You can see the escalation. First, it's the earth. First, it's vegetation. First, it's the environment. Then it's harming people who are, who are not sealed. And then it's not harming, it's kill those who are not sealed in preparation, but not all of them just some of them in the lead up to the outpouring of the final bulls of wrath after the seventh trumpet sounds. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. So a couple things to take from this. The target of this judgment event is people. The source of this judgment event is God giving the keys to an angel to release incarcerated demons to harm, to injure, to inflict pain upon unmarked people. The nature of this pain 
is like a scorpion sting for five months, meaning it's making you sick. It's pain. It's excruciating pain. Now, I've seen people uh, bit by scorpions before. Uh, thankfully, it wasn't really bad ones and wasn't really heavy, but it was, it was very, it was painful. Uh, like a stingray sting for those of you uh, who live on the coast like I grew up in Florida you get st sting with a stingray or jellyfish and it's just it's just pain the goal of this judgment event is the inflicting of pain not because God is a cruel taskmaster because humans are cruel and rebellious and God in his kindness and in his mercy is giving them an opportunity to soften their hearts and thus to be exempt from the wrath to come, or to harden their hearts and drink the full cup of the wrath that is to come. This is, an op this is a merciful thing. You say, man, that's pretty intense. Like, like tormenting people for five months? Now, don't get lost in the details of this thing. You go, locusts, like, the, what? The scorpion, locust, demon, you, you know, you try to draw a picture of it. You're like, yeah, it's a, Demonic locust scorpion. Like, I, I don't know, guys. This is what I'm saying about this is being a, a, a strange chapter in the book. I don't know exactly what this means when it says that there's demonic locusts, scorpions released on the earth. What I do know is this. The impact of it is human beings who are not marked being tormented for five months and wanting to die the pain is so extreme that they want to die, but they can't die. They can't find death. They would prefer to be dead, but they can't die. In verse 7, we read the description of these locusts. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for... See, you're already like, what? Locusts that look like horses? Prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces. So now we're already in the realm in the category of this is not a locust plague. Meaning this is a movie playing out for, for John, right? The analogy we used at the beginning. It's as if, you know, an angel sat John in a chair, put a projector in front of him and said, okay, take notes. And he, he's playing this video, right? And he's watching the video. He says, I saw the trumpet sound. All of a sudden I saw... It, it was, I don't know, it's kind of like locusts. You're like, locusts? John, explain the locusts. He's like, well, they, they were locusts, but they, they kind of looked like horse locusts. Horse locusts. Yeah, but, yeah, but, they, but they had people's faces. You're like, wait, what? Th that means it's not a locust, John. John's like, look, I'm just doing my best to describe what I'm seeing. And what I'm seeing is a reality that's very tangible and very real from a realm that we're not familiar with and we don't know how to describe or interact with it. The demonic realm is a very, very bizarre realm in scripture that it's very difficult to, you know, draw out what it is you're seeing because of the nature of the demonic, the nature of demons, the nature of powers and principalities. Look, he goes on, their hair was like women's hair and their teeth like lion's teeth. It's so bizarre. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon and in Greek is called Apollyon, which means the destroyer or destruction. The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still to come. Okay, what are we looking at here? Let's simplify this in terms of the core main message. God is initiates a judgment event that's kicked off by the sounding of the fifth trumpet. When that fifth trumpet sounds, demonic beings are released upon the earth to harm people who are not marked for five months. This is, constitutes the first of three woes leading up to the final woe, 
which is the, the end of the window of mercy. That window of mercy closes at the third woe and the bowls of wrath are poured out. This woe here is a merciful act from God to give the nations of the earth a final warning. He's still not killing them yet because he could kill all these people and the Lord doesn't kill any of them. In his mercy, he gives them an opportunity to repent, to soften their hearts and not to harden their hearts. Now, another dynamic here that's important is this one of Abaddon and Apollyon, the destroyer. What this means is, is that there's a demonic hierarchy. There's a structure within the powers and rulers of the air. We know this from the book of Job. We know this from the Gospels. We know this from the epistles. Is that there is, in the heavenly unseen places, there are structures, authority structures within the demonic, just like there are within the angelic, within the divine council and administration of the kingdom of heaven. Okay? It's, it's strange stuff, but it's very, very real. It's very, very concrete. It's very, very biblical. So what we see here is this demonic locust-like army is under the leadership of a commander, a demonic commander named the Destroyer. And in every language, his name takes on a different meaning. Apollyon, Abaddon, in English it means he's the Destroyer, which gives reason to why he was in chains and bound up during the course of natural history from the point of the rebellion of angels. We know from demonology or angelology is that there, there, that at one point, at some time, there was a rebellion where fallen angels, rebellious angels, some were allowed to retain their position of influence and authority in heavenly places during this evil, present evil, wicked age, and some of them were not allowed. They were incarcerated. They were jailed in hell. Hell is a temporary place, a temporary prison, as it were, before the eternal reality of the lake of fire, of eternal consequence. Hell is not eternal consequence. It's a temporary reality before the eternal reality of the lake of fire. Now, these demonic beings are held inside a structure of incarceration under, and their commander, the destroyer, still retains his position of authority in the midst of that. And this angel comes, unlocks it, and says, go. You know, it's the equivalent of, this is a bad and not, you know, it's, it's a very natural analogy, but I think it's one that, you know, makes sense. The beginning of the Syrian war, when the which was largely a uh, secular revolution. It was not a jihadist thing, you know. It is now, but at the beginning it was a, you know, a democratic, secularist revolution trying to cast off the Assad regime, trying to cast off the government's oppressive rule. And as the regime was being driven out, what ended up happening was Assad needed a pretext to attack civilians because he couldn't just go down and, you know, into the streets and gun everybody down. So what he did is he released prisoners, jihadists, from prisons and said, all right, guys, you're free, go for it. Those guys went out into the world, into Syria, armed themselves, and started attacking the Assad regime, in which case the Assad regime was able to brand the entire Syrian revolution as a jihadist enterprise. But really, he engineered it so that he had a pretext to fire at school teachers and professors and doctors and lawyers who were opposing him uh, and opposing his government on uh, legitimate grounds, you could say. My, the point is, you said, don't why you bring that up? Because here's an analogy. If you had a jihadist group in prison and you release them, there is an authority structure even in prison. And when you get out, it's kind of that dynamic. So imagine the jihadists and their commanders and the the, the door to the jail opens and these guys go running out into the free and go, woohoo, let's go do whatever we want. It's the same dynamic with the demonic. They're released. It's like, okay, guys, you're good to go. Now, I'm not, I'm saying it's a bad analogy because it's, you know, drawing comparison between Assad and God, and that's not at all what I'm saying. But you get my point. The, the point is that in incarceration of the demonic, there is a authority structure in place. 
and that authority structure is, is, you know, I don't know how important that is to know, but it's important enough to where John recorded it. And he said, yeah, I, I saw that these demonic locust beings that are tormenting people, I saw that they were under a king or a leader or a commander. Okay, let's move on to verse 13, the sixth angel. This is where it takes another uh, turn into escalation. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. The Euphrates today runs through Turkey, Syria, Iraq. Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels, this is, this is just staggering. Just want to go through this slowly. There's the river. There's four angels who are bound, okay? Look at this. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. There is so much in this, so much mystery and intrigue here of like, what, wait, what, how, why? The river Euphrates, there are angels who are at present waiting, hanging out, chilling, watching history unfold until an appointed moment. You know these phrases you know, that people like to throw around, no one knows the day or the hour, all these kinds of things. These angels are prepared after a five-month window of torment of those who dwell on the earth who are not marked the end of that five-month period, we assume. We, now, this may overlap. The fifth and the sixth trumpet may happen. You know, the five-month torment may overlap with the sixth trumpet. We don't know. Or it may be five months. At the end of the five months, when there has not been a repentance, the Lord says, okay, escalate the judgments. Either way, they're prepared, it says, for an hour, a day, a month, and a year. They've been prepared. They're ready. They were ready then. They're ready now, guys. They're there right now on the Euphrates River. I've been to the Euphrates River in uh, multiple countries in Iraq, and I've looked at it, and I always go, I wonder where those angels are. And I wonder, I wonder why there. I wonder wh why there. They could be, you know, uh, posted anywhere, but the Lord puts their post there and says, wait for the day, the hour, the month, the year. And they say, well, what do you want us to do in that time when you say, go? And the Lord says, it's the sixth trumpet. When you hear the sixth trumpet, do the deed. They say, what's the deed? Kill a third of humanity. Now, guys, remember this. In, in chapter 6, it says a quarter of the earth's population was killed. Okay, so let's, let's take... Let's do like apples, okay? If, if one apple is taken away, a quarter, and then there's three apples left, and then a third of the apples are taken away, that leaves you with half of Earth's population is killed within a 42-month time frame. Even more compressed than 42 months, possibly. Staggering. Now, right now, seven, eight billion people live on the planet Let's just assume the Earth's population grows to 10 billion. You're looking at somewhere between 4 and 5 billion people killed in a 42-month period. Absolutely staggering. Now, you may say, that's so, like, horrifically severe. Why, Lord, why? And the Lord goes... You've had the seals, you've had the first four trumpets, you've had the torment of the fifth trumpet, and yet you're still steeped in rebellion and staunch in your resistance to my leadership and gnashing your teeth at my righteous judgments. Next comes a more severe confrontation in the form of the death of a third of the earth. 
Now guys, this is, this is crazy. This is, think about this. Half the earth's population, but we're, we're not even to the bowls yet. He's saying, he's still, my point is this, he's still using restraint. The Lord is still restraining and saying, I'm not going to kill everyone. I'm, okay, torment, we did torment, you're not responding. Now we'll go to not harm, but death for a third of the earth, but not the full thing yet. Wait for that. I want to see how you respond to this. He releases the judgments on the earth. Look at the next, the next passage here. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They wore breastplates, the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. And the heads of the horses were like lion's heads. And fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. Now, there's kind of a theory. You'll hear this thing in some prophecy circles, the 200 million man army. That's where this comes from. And they say, oh, there's going to be this massive army that's going to come over the Euphrates River uh, to either attack Jerusalem or attack uh, Antichrist or something like that. The language here is the same as the last judgment event, meaning th this is in the same way that the fifth trumpet is not actual natural locusts or natural scorpions, it's demonic beings in the same way the horsemen described in the sixth trumpet are not actual horsemen. Because some people say, you know, there's a theory in the prophecy camp that China is going to muster this massive army, or Turkey, who has the largest army, they're going to mass and, you know, massive military, uh, you know, thing, they're going to cross the Euphrates, and that's going to be the result of the third of the death of, the, of mankind. I don't think that's what this is for a number of reasons. Uh, one is because the grammar of this thing and the, 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 what the text says itself. You know, if this was an actual army or an actual locusts, the Lord would just say it's army and locusts. But he wouldn't say they had heads of horses, but they were like lions and they had smoke and fire coming out of their mouths. Now, the fantastic bizarre visual imagery here is given for a purpose. You don't have this, what I'm saying. You don't have this in the other judgment events. We've, we've gone through seven seals. We've gone through four trumpets and everything is very straightforward, very down to earth, very take it at face value. You don't have to worry about what does it mean when all the water turns to blood. It just means water turns to blood. You know, if it says that there's going to be economic collapse, it just means economic collapse. There's war, pieces taken from the earth. It just means war. But now you have demonic beings being described in very bizarre language. The point here that I want to make is that don't anticipate some massive Chinese military invasion. Or that's, I don't think that's the point of this. The point of this is this is a judgment event on, upon, those who dwell on the earth and who are resisting and rebelling against the escalating judgments of God as they're being released on the earth. Look at this. By these three plagues, okay, that's another reason why um, I don't think we should take this as a, you know, expecting a, you know, look at the, the, these three things. Fire, smoke, sulfur came out of their mouths, okay? By these three, fire, smoke, and sulfur, a third of mankind was killed by the fire, by the smoke, and by the sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their ta tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. It's, it's, it's bizarre. Go, oh, I don't know how to imagine that. I don't know either, but what I do know is that it, that's not clear to me. I don't know how it's actually going to look in real time. You go, well, what is it? How do we know the sixth trumpet's taking place? Will we actually see like horses with flamethrowers out of their mouths, you know, kind of galloping around and people dying? No, I don't think so. <laughs> what we will see. Let's distinguish from what you will see and what you don't see. And I, I'll draw an analogy here, a parallel in the New Testament. 
uh, two parallels here, actually. One from the ministry of Jesus, one from the ministry of Paul. The ministry of Jesus, we saw a man named Legion who was riddled with demons that you couldn't see, yet he was tormented. Okay? Then the demons were cast out of the man, and he was brought into his right mind. Okay? The other parallel we see in the life of Paul is he's casting out demons from people, and we don't see the demons, but seven sons of Sceva in Acts 17, they try to do the same thing. They try to cast out demons. We don't see the demons, but the demons end up beating up the guys that tried to cast the demons out. Another example in the, epistle, the epistles of Paul and his pastoral leadership model, there's numerous times where he would say to somebody, hand them over to Satan, deliver them over to Satan. He says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, deliver them up. Or the same thing in Timothy, he says to Timothy, he says, look, if this person is unrepentant, deliver them over to Satan because if through the tormenting of their flesh, it may result in the salvation of their soul. That's theologically what's taking place in chapter five, or the fifth and the sixth trumpet. It's the handing of humanity over to Satan, to the demonic, for the destruction of their flesh because of the potential for the salvation of their souls. That's the framework here. So on one hand, we see a man being tormented by demons, a legion, and Jesus delivers the man from the demons. In Paul's ministry, we see Paul delivering people to demons as he's delivering people from demons. It's a very interesting theological uh, language in both. We, people are delivered from demons and people are delivered to demons for the salvation of their soul. Very, very interesting uh, you know, contrast juxtaposition. Paul delivers demons and delivers people to them. God is doing that in the fifth and the sixth trumpet. This is not about trying to identify where the 200 million man army is going to come from. This is about the message of this thing is about the handing over of humanity so that they get what they desire so that potentially some might be saved. In, 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 in many ways, what we're looking at here is humanity going full bore into full submission to the demonic realm and the full hardening of their hearts against the leadership of God. Look at verse 20. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of their works of their hands, nor giving up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see, hear, or walk. Nor did they repent of their murder, their sorceries, their sexual immorality, or their theft. These four things are mentioned as the four most prominent expressions of human depravity, sin, wickedness, and evil before the third and final woe and before the wrath of God is poured out upon humanity and it's finished. They did not repent. Look at verse 20. The rest of mankind who were not killed so a third of the earth is killed. There's two thirds left, two apples left. The two thirds who are left did not repent. So we see the description of what they're doing. It's both a sin issue, meaning inflicting violence on other human beings, and it's also a worship issue. Look at the language here. They wouldn't repent of the works of their hands and of worshiping demons. Worshipping demons. Now, some of you, you know, you may have been to, uh, I don't know, you've been to India or Thailand or something. You've seen people worshipping, you know, this. You read that and you think, oh, so I guess this is all the Thai people getting hammered or, you know, Balinese people getting hammered for, you know, worshipping all the, the gods. Is that what this is? Don't, don't put it in that category. This is something else entirely different here. 
This is open allegiance and worship of demons in the midst of judgments being released on the earth for people who continue, who continue to harden their hearts in an escalating way. As the judgments escalate, the hardness of the human heart escalates. As the judgment escalates, the hardness of the human heart escalates. And then John describes it as saying it's work of hands, it's worshiping demons, it's murder, it's sorcery, sexual immorality, and theft. We see six things described here. The six fruits of the final rage of man against God in the generation of the Lord's return. The work of their hands, the worship of their hearts, the murdering of other people, sorcery, which the word for sorcery some commentators point out is actually the word for pharmacy, where we, where we get the word pharmacy from, it's drugs. So some people will take this and say it's, you know, it's the use of drugs. I think the Greek can point us in different ways. I'm not a Greek scholar, I don't know, but I think if you say, you know, this is just people doing meth and, you know, heroin, I don't think that gets to the full, the full scope of what this is describing here. Killing people, sorcery, sexual immorality, and theft. This isn't like, you know, looting the local Best Buy when the economic collapse hits. This is going to be something of another order. This isn't going to just be, you know, road rage incident. Lots of people are killing each other. This is something of another order. The fact that they're, it says they're worshiping demons means this is the turning point in the book of Revelation. Where the first woe was released and they did not repent. The second woe is released and they did not repent. And the fact that they did not, it's not just they didn't repent, they're now pushing back against the Lord who's showing them mercy, but a strong mercy in the form of judgments. Now as the judgment is being poured out and the hearts of humanity is growing harder and harder, the expression of that hardness of heart comes out in these six things. The works of their hands, the worship of their hearts, the worshiping of demons, murder, sorcery, sexual immorality, and theft. Now, here's the thing about worshiping demons, because you may, you may hear that and you go, what does that look like, worshiping demons? I don't even know how to imagine what a worshiping a demon looks like. I, mean, I wouldn't know how to if someone said worship a demon. I wouldn't know how to. Worship is, you know, we, we've been so, the term worship's been just so destroyed by unbiblical models of church. We, we equate worship to, you know, the 15-minute thing at the beginning of a Christian church service. You know, wor that's not worship. That's not worship. That's just singing songs, guys. That's not worship. When it says that they worship demons, it doesn't mean that there's going to be, you know, big gatherings of people singing songs and we love you demons, you're great. What it means to worship a demon is to be its slave is to be addicted to that thing, is to give your allegiance, your love, your loyalty, your blood, to give your life for that thing. When we worship God, it doesn't mean that we sing songs to him. It means we give him our blood, we give him our lives, we give him our will, our volition, we give him the work of our hands, we give him everything. What this text is saying here, what's so powerful about it, is it's saying humanity, pushed against the wall, they're back against the wall with the judgments of God escalating. What humanity chooses to do is to give themselves to demons. And what the demons, here's the crazy thing, guys, we're coming in for a landing, so this is about to wrap up, but catch this. If you worship demons, the demons turn on you and torment you and kill you. If you worship the Lord, he protects you, he defends you, he advocates for you, he died for you, he adopted you, he rose from the dead for you, he's going to give you a place and an internal inheritance and he's going to pour out all the blessings and all the love and all the affection that the Father put on the Son is going to be put upon you. That's what you get if you worship the Son of God. If you worship demons, here's what you get. You get wrath and fire and sulfur and destruction. 
and the very beings that you're worshiping without even necessarily even knowing it will destroy you for it. This is ultimately sin running its full course, human iniquity running its full course, reaching its apocalyptic age-ending climax with the full hardening of humanity like Pharaoh hardened his heart. Absolutely, absolutely staggering. We'll end with this. There is multiple texts that describe the mercy and the restraint of God before the end of the age in that he does not release things until certain things happen. You know, in Daniel chapter 8, he says that until the transgression has reached its fullness, you know, even before the conquests of, of the nation of Israel to come into the land of Canaan and to, to, uh, to begin their tenure here in the land at the very beginning in Genesis, there's an incredible statement. He says, not until the fullness of iniquity or the fullness of sin or the ripeness, not until the sin of the people of the land has reached a, a, a particular height. You know, leading up to the Exodus story, you had 430 years in between the promise being given and when they would actually leave Egypt and set out to go take the land. Why? Because the Lord said, I'm not going to inflict the judgment upon those who live in the land until their maturity of sin has reached its appointed climax. The Lord says, and think about this, the tenderness and mercy of the Lord in this. The Lord says, hey, I promise Abraham to give your family this land. And, and Abraham's descendants, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, all the, Joseph, all the tribes that, that, that came out of the 12 tribes, they're going, okay, can, can we take the land, like, can we take all the land now? And the Lord goes, no, no. Why? Why, Lord, you promised us the land? He said, because there's people on the land. And right now, if to take the land from them would be an act of injustice. But once their sin has reached a point of maturity, you can take the land. And there's a dynamic at the end of the age where the Lord says, I'm not going to do certain things until the wickedness of man reaches its appointed climax, its appointed maturity, its peak, its pinnacle, its fullness. In the same way that there's the fullness of the Gentiles and the fullness of Israel, we're also dealing with the fullness of the wrath of Satan and the fullness of the sin of man growing up together. So let's, let's wrap this up and, and do a concluding statement here. These are two of the most bizarre events in the entire book of Revelation. Demonic locusts, scorpions, and demonic horses. One that torments the earth for five months. One that kills a third of the earth. Now, there can be a temptation to get lost in the, all the fantastical, bizarre language of this chapter. But I urge you... Stick to the main message of this thing and ask yourself the main takeaway points from this. If God is going to move from touching the environment to harming but not killing and then killing and not harming but not killing in full but only killing partially and man's wickedness continues to percolate, continues to mature, continues to grow before the, the final woe, what can we take from this? What do we deduce? It's a very simple message. Don't worship demons. Live in the light. Live in the day. No matter what you've done, no matter where you are right now, no matter what decisions you've made, no, one, no matter what mistakes you've made, there's opportunity to turn and repent. Now, for you watching this, I've made mistakes. You've made mistakes. Mistakes and sin right now in this window of mercy is a gift. Because there's a time coming when there's going to be no more mercy. And when, these, when the pressure and the dynamics are on, what's in the heart is going to come out. Meaning, if you have even a little bit of rebellion in your heart right now, a little bit of opposition to the leadership of the Lord in your heart right now, if pressure is applied to that, would you harden your heart or would you soften your heart? If pressure was applied to your life right now, like the events described in the book of Revelation, would you grow softer or would you grow harder? And that is the simple, straight message of Revelation chapter 9 and the three woes, particularly the first two woes. 
Are you growing more tender or are you mo growing more calloused? Are you growing more responsive or are you growing more obstinate? Are you growing more alive or are you growing more numb? Are you dying to sin or are you dying in sin? This is the gauntlet that's been laid before us. And this is what the book of Revelation calls us to do, is to worship the Lord and the Lord alone. And that doesn't mean singing him songs and then living lives that contradict the songs that we sing. It means giving everything that we have to him and becoming like him in all things, that when these events take place, the one that we love, the one that we worship, protects us. He doesn't destroy us like Abaddon, like the great destroyer. I thank you for watching this session. Um, I'm not sure the next few weeks what they hold. Um, Joel and I are both uh, traveling a bit, getting ready for the premiere in Dallas. We've got a lot going on. We're also starting production on a new film here in a few weeks, so I'm not entirely sure if the uh, the Bible study flow is going to get interrupted or not over the next few weeks. It's possible. So just to give you a heads up, we, we try. Um, we, I mean, this is our priority, Joel and I. We're, we're constantly putting this to the front of the list of priorities. But with so many things swirling at the moment, sometimes it's just not possible to get to a camera like this and to, to do it because of uh, just practical dynamics of travel and whatnot. So just to give you a heads up, we're aiming. We might film the sessions ahead of time if we can and put them out so every week they come out. Uh, or we may miss a week here or there over the next month or so. But guys, thank you for watching this heavy session, but a very important one. From here, we go to a very, very important place. Revelation chapter 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. These four or five chapters are absolutely staggering and at the heart of the book of Revelation. I'm so excited to get into them. Bless you from the Golan Heights and Maranatha.